It's time for Security Now, episode OX100, 256. <laughs> Coming up, Steve takes a look at a utility I wouldn't live without, LastPass. It's the best way to keep your passwords, or is it? Steve Gibson gives it his seal of approval next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Winamp. Subscribe to Security Now and all your favorite podcasts with the ultimate media player. Download it for free at winamp.com. Video bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 256, recorded July 9th, 2010. Last Pass Security. Security Now is brought to you by Go to Assist Express. If you're in tech support, clients rely on you for fast and reliable service. Help them the fast and easy way with Go to Assist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com slash security. It's time for Security Now, the show that covers all your security and privacy needs online and off. Here he is, the man who makes this show, the guy behind Security Now, the head at uh, the Gibson Research Corporation, GRC.com, creator of Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance utility. He's also a security guru who discovered and coined the term spyware, wrote the first anti-spyware, has written many great security programs like Shields Up that he gives away for free on GRC.com. Mr. Stephen Gibson. Hey, Steve. And on top of all that, I have to say that I've invested more of my time in in the research for this podcast than I have for a very long time. All for nothing at all, <laughs> just because he loves you, the people. Well, thank you. This is actually a, a, to a topic near and dear to my heart. Yes, I know that you're a LastPass user. We've got a huge body of listeners from the looks of the feedback that I've received because I've I've referred to LastPass. I've said, yeah, I want to take a look at it. I, in fact, I sent a I, I I sent a ping off to those guys through email, wanting to establish a contact at LastPass, saying you guys are on my radar and I'm going to need to get around to it. And so I think it's fitting. Episode 256, which of course is a number near and dear to my binary assembly language programmer's heart. That being exactly two to the power of Eight, which is the number of combinations, 256 combinations that, that eight bits can take. Um, so this is going to be a great episode. I've spent uh, at least several days, uh, and now even more than that, using LastPass. So this is a complete security analysis and feature uh, walkthrough on what I have to say is, I think, the best solution possible. Ooh. Okay, well, I don't... Mean, it's it's really good. Don't give us the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the lead before we get the, the details. But I know people want the meat of the matter. And we do apologize. I know this show is coming out a day late. We, we, uh, had a, we normally record this Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on uh, live.twit.tv. And uh, if you tuned in at that time, you know uh, we were having some sort of uh, connectivity issue. We rewired the entire studio over the weekend, and uh, something Just went wrong. No small job in itself. Oh, poor Ken Shepardson. I thank Ken. Uh, Ken is Colleen's replacement, and he's just been dynamite as our chief of engineering and our studio manager, John Slanina, and our uh, tech wiz wizard, uh, uh, Burke, uh, all have worked really hard. Also, uh, Kelly from, uh, um, uh, well, what is it? It's one one light truck, one truck. <laughs> Allinonetruck.com. There it is. Thank you, Ken. Kelly from allinonetruck.com, who did the, put in the new grid and put in the new lighting. Uh, and just really did a spectacular job. And, of course, uh, Alex Lindsay, who recommended Kelly and came in and helped, and Ardell from uh, the Pixel Core helped. So they were in here. We had five people working their butts off over the weekend. They got it all back together. And we were able to do shows, but we we're getting this weird hesitation on Skype, and we're still trying to track it down. We think it might well, have something to do with uh, the, 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 the buffering that we also get on our live stream, and so we will let you know. We may be a day late, but we will not be a dollar short. <laughs> Good. So uh, coming up, last pass. Before we do that, though, do you have any uh, updates you'd like to pass along? Got all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, 
Uh, I did want to mention that apparently I missed an out of cycle Microsoft Windows 64 bit security update, uh, which somehow slipped under my radar last week. I didn't even have a chance or really that much concern, <laughs> frankly, to verify it, but someone through uh, Twitter said, hey, there, you know, I guess he's a 64 bit Windows user, and he said, hey, there was an out of cycle update. It's out of cycle because if that had occurred last week or the week before, well, that was that was not when we're expecting it. Normally, this, of course, as we all know, occurs on the second Tuesday of the month, which is next Tuesday, and we do have some good things happening then. Um, also, Google's Chrome browser, prior to the current version, which the current version being 5.0.375.86, has multiple <laughs> security vulnerabilities. These all sound, sound like star dates now. It does, don't they? doesn't it? Star date 5.0.375.86. Um, Google isn't into big disclosures of their vulnerabilities the way Microsoft has sort of been beaten into, and even the way the Mozilla folks are very open about the things they're fixing. So we don't know exactly what it is that was fixed in Chrome. Google's browser, but um, we know that there were some memory corruption problems that they fixed, and that's always a little bit of a concern because that's the, the, the way that remote code execution vulnerabilities can happen. So um, anyone using Chrome, and there's more people using Chrome now than there, there were, you know, three or four months ago. Well, Chrome's, before. Yeah, it's yeah, Chrome's market share is growing. Um, at the expense of IE and Firefox, believe it or not. Um, so, in fact, I think I said last week that Chrome had exceeded Safari in in market share, which is surprising. Uh, wait, maybe it's Safari on Windows. Yeah, Can't probably is. Safari. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. That's a good question. We, 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 we noticed that as well, and it wasn't clear. You know, Chrome does an automatic update. So for most people, unless they've somehow disabled that, you won't have to think about it, right? Good. Good. Yeah. Yes, that is the case. And... The, the, the Google folks who manage Chrome have said that they are liking Firefox's um, uh, automatic blocking of insecure plugins. Remember that that was a feature that, that we got in, that the Mozilla folks added to Firefox some while ago, a few months ago, where Firefox is now taking some responsibility for noting when plugins are obsolete because of security problems and will preemptively protect its users from using known insecure plugins. Well, much as Firefox 4 has, is borrowing heavily from the look of Google's Chrome, that is to say the Chrome of Chrome, um, the Chrome guys are going to be borrowing that functionality from Firefox. So that's going to be, it's not happening now, but they have said they like it and they're going to be adding that. Yeah. I, you know, Firefox uh, does notify you that it downloads it and then says, I got an update, you want to install it. Right. Chrome's just silent. You wouldn't know you had a new, I don't think, unless I'm setting it weird. I don't think you'd have a new, know you had a new Chrome unless you looked. So do you now have 375.86? I have 99 on the Mac. Oh, you're just shooting right ahead. And that's the point is you don't even know <laughs> what it what if you do about Chrome uh you know however that is on whatever browser you're on uh, whatever platform you're on um there is at least on the Mac it says Google Chrome is up to date 5.0.375.99 and but there is an update now button next to it but it's been my experience with Chrome that it just happens you don't have to think about it and right. you, it won't and I it do won't remember them you. saying that that's what they were going to do when they originally came out with it they said you know we're just going to take care of this we're going to you know just move you forward there's mixed so feelings nice. about that corporate likes to know right corporate likes to know what i like is that they apparently have technology which is not requiring a full shutdown and restart. It's just, or maybe they're they're like holding the version they have until you do shut down and restart. You know, when when you're updating Mozilla, it's a it's a major event in terms of like, okay, well, we're going to have to close this down. And right. for me, I don't, I I'm embarrassed how many tabs I have open. I just sort of use them as placeholders <laughs> for my brain. It's like, oh, I'll get back to that one of these years. 
So I, I tend to be a little tab happy. So, so restarting uh, Firefox with as many tabs as I have is sort of a major event because it goes through and tries oh, to it's a pain. Pull, pull all those pages again. It's a pain. Yeah. I'm looking through the settings. I don't see a setting. I'm sure there is one to turn off uh, automatic updates or to make them manual somehow, but I don't see one right off the top of my head. So I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Um, we discussed last week, as we pretty much always do, Adobe's recent actions and the fact that they did their um, major update to fix the the final problems with the the Flash plugin, and also remember that they they fixed Flash first, but they but but Reader and Acrobat were coming later, and then last week they they introduced nine point three point three, which caught those up. That is their own, the, the version of the Flash they were bringing along. Well, we've talked also about this very controversial launching capability, which the hackers have figured out how to use. It was Dieter Stevens, um, our listeners will remember, many months ago, who came up with a way of sort of finessing the dialogue, the warning dialogue, which would pop up to let you know that your PDF wanted to run something, in, as a way of hiding the fact that what it wanted to run was malware. Well, <laughs> with last week's fix, Adobe, thank goodness, by now, um, they, are, they are now disabling that launch functionality by default. And they've also created a blacklist, which prevents them from running, for example, cmd.exe, the, the command exe. The problem is... They didn't do it right. And it was only out for a couple days before a hacker figured out that if you put command.exe in double quotes, it would run it again. So uh, Dieter has on his blog, it's blog.dieterstevens, D-I-D-I-E-R-S-T-E-V-E-N-S.com. He shows a workaround for putting a closing double quote on cmd.exe. Exe for anyone who's worried about it. Uh, my feeling is now that they've disabled the launch functionality by default, and you know they're 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 taking clear proactive steps to close this. This is probably a non-issue, and all of our lis listeners will have manually disabled that by now. So um, I did want to say though that Adobe's done the right thing, and you know thank goodness yeah. I'm glad for that. Yeah, we talked last week about the Windows Help Center zero day flaw, which is, you know, being exploited with increasing frequency. It's really scaling up rapidly now. Um, I wanted to, and, and this is that it was controversial. You remember that the Google engineer, the security engineer at Google, Tavis Ormandy, was, he, he released it after like notifying Microsoft on the weekend, on a Saturday, and then he let the news go four days later, sort of surprising them and everyone else that there was this way to, to exploit Windows in a way that, um, that was, well, that would allow code to be executed remotely, which is the worst kind of exploit. Microsoft has reported that they've detected more than 10,000 PCs infected through this exploit in the U.S., predominantly in the U.S., Russia, Portugal, Germany, and Brazil, though the highest percentage is in um, Portugal and Russia, for whatever reason. The good news is, next Tuesday, this gets fixed. So, you know, this has been, you know, they're responding pretty quickly. Essentially, re remember that this, this news hit just after their prior second Tuesday update. It was the weekend after their last second Tuesday of the month in June. So, you know, they're, they're doing this with, you know, the next update, second Tuesday of the month in July. So I think they're being as, you know, they're, they're reacting as quickly as they can. And this is something which is getting exploited a lot. So that's being closed down. Um, in other news, we'll remember last week, we talked about this wacky report about uh, by the, um, the, the SSL researcher, Ivan Ristik, whose company had recently been purchased by Qualys. Um, he sent a couple 
uh, tweets to me, which came to my attention through Twitter. And then I thought, I wonder if he's po posted anything in the feedback uh, slot for GRC, because I had no way to reach him through, um, through Twitter. Sure enough, he had posted a very polite note. Um, he was a little bit tweaked by my characterization of him. And I think he actually said in his email to me, no one likes to be called a moron. Um, so I was pleased with, you know, his note. Um, and he showed me, in fact, I, I said, well, you know, it's a little hard to understand what it was you were trying to, to demonstrate. And I sent him a bunch of links to sort of confirming news reports, everyone picking up on this notion that only, what was it, three point something uh, percent of SSL certificates were valid, which was unfortunately the conclusion that people drew. And it, it turns out that that even Komodo, which is a, a very well-known SSL certificate um, authority, they put out a press release calling for Qualys and Ivan to please clarify what it was that he was saying because they felt it was grossly mischaracterizing the, you know, the nature of SSL and what the industry was doing. Um, he has done some blog posts since, which attempt to explain his way out of this. Um, the problem is, for example, I, I quoted from his blog post. At one point, sort of in summary, he says, the reason we have so many domain names that do not have proper SSL certificates installed is that most of them are not intended to have them. And it's like... yeah. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's like, what? No, that that's not. He still doesn't want to say that. He doesn't get it. That he, that, well, that, that, that scanning domain names to see if they answer with SSL and then comparing the name to the, to the certificate means nothing. It's a broken system. Well. It's crazy. It's not. It, 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 you know, there are. You know, it's, it's as I said when I talked about it, I said, you know, I've got spinright.com aimed at the same IP as www.grc.com because if someone puts in spinright.com, I redirect them to www.grc.com because I mean, it's just it's simple to do. And that way I don't have to give it its own IP. You know, no one needs to connect securely to spinright.com because I just bounce them over to, to to GRC. So if you check the if you look up the IP address for spinright.com, well it's the same as GRC.com. Well there but you can only have a single SSL certificate bound to a single IP. And that's you know GRC.com's certificate is valid and bound to the IP for GRC. So you know what he's doing is wacky. And I think I mean, he he clearly knows what he's talking about. I spent some time at his site looking through his stuff. You know, the guy understands SSL. He just, I think, sort of went off maybe prematurely. And now he's embarrassed. Uh, yeah, and then there isn't any way really to to dig himself out of this because right. you know this. Well, this, yes, there is. He should say, "Oh, never mind. <laughs> I was measuring something inconsequential." Uh, yeah, in in a way that that doesn't affect or hurt the internet, that doesn't ref that doesn't reflect badly at all on SSL or security certificates. And what's funny is he talks about twenty two million uh, like certificates, but only three, I think it is, or less than that, have ever been issued in the history of man. <laughs> so. So, you know, it's like all of his numbers are wrong. So it's like, well, okay. I mean, I, I, I'm just going to a personal message, Ivan. You have two choices. You can say, I made a mistake, and we'll say, oh, he made a mistake. Honest mistake, yeah. and he's admitted it. Or if you continue to try to prevail, you know, kind of circumnabulate this, the assumption is going to be it was link bait, or he was in some way trying to get attention, or, you know, uh, the, is the, the only, you have two bad choices, but one's a lot better, which is to say, oops, I made a mistake. The other well, choice is not good. And and the fact is he is he's not a moron. No, he, he, well you know, he just he well no he's not. I mean he really understands SSL. He's got that nailed. 
Um, but I think he's trying to demonstrate something or, or, or maybe someone said, come up with something for the next security conference. I think he's, he's speaking about this at the Black Cat conference. Oh, okay. And so he like thought, oh, I'll do that. You made you a know? mistake. And it's like, yeah, okay. Big deal. Um, speaking of making a mistake, it turns out, remember we talked recently about Firefox has been releasing versions pretty quickly. They went from 3.6.4. Yeah. Now they're at 3.6.6. .6. Well, one of the things that they did with 3.6.4 was to add protection, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, for frozen plugins. If Flash or Silverlight or the Flash Silverlight, what's the third big one? Uh, Flash Silverlight. Flash Silverlight. <laughs> There's another big one. Uh and the third big one, if any, if either of the, if any of those three hang, well, it's no it will no longer hang your browser. Um, so what happens is Java. Um, uh, no. I don't think it's no. You think it's a plugin? It's a plugin. Kind. It's a big plugin. Hmm. Might Shockwave? be QuickTime. QuickTime. It was QuickTime. Quick time. Yes. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Jeff. So Flash, Silverlight, or QuickTime lock up if they freeze become unresponsive then firefox will see see that and and not let the you know not like not have it hang the whole browser you'll just have to reload that tab well another chrome feature by the way there yes their their timeout was 10 seconds and it turns out that on older slower machines users playing one of Leo's favorite, well, I don't know if it's a game so much. Uh, Plants versus Zombies. Farmville. Farmville. Farmville is hosted, apparently aggressively, in Flash. And so if you're playing Farmville on a browser, you're in Flash. Right. And it turns out that it's not uncommon for Farmville to make Flash unresponsive <laughs> for... As many for more than ten seconds. As anybody who's ever played Farmville knows. So what happened was when everyone upgraded to Firefox three point six point four, their Farmville started crashing because Firefox was not patient enough. Oh yeah, timeout. The length of the timeout is very critical. Yes. Oh, How well, long you wait so, before you give up? It's which is annoying in itself. I mean, the fact that we have something so. You know, I think should hang that long. Random. Yeah. Uh, well, true. But anyway, so what? What the reason we've had this quick jump from three point six point four to three point six point six is that the Mozilla developers realized that a substantial portion of their user base now, not as a percentage of all users probably, but still enough that it that they were realizing we're going to drive people away from Firefox to some other browser, though that is the you know the Farmville addicts unless we fix this quickly. So they quickly change the timeout to, I know it's big now, I think maybe it's 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. I mean, they decided to go way high because they didn't know what the, you know, if 15 would be enough or right. 25, and they didn't want to keep marching it forward slowly. So they went to 45 seconds. I think that was the number. Could Farmville, so, or, or a similar situation, could they, could they send out a heartbeat of some kind just to say, hey, I'm thinking here? Well... Wouldn't that be the preferable thing to do than just no, be unresponsive for 10 seconds while the server is processing or whatever? It's certainly the case that in Windows, apps can become unresponsive if, if, the, if the thread which is servicing the user interface gets busy or, or hung somehow. And no heartbeat. And, would That would block everything, including a heartbeat. Right. And, and, and you know, that often, you know, in... in in less than well-engineered apps, let's put it that way. So, for example, in my DNS benchmark, I have a thread which runs the UI, which is completely separate from the many other threads that are busy running around querying servers and doing, you know, other things. And so, you can, you can like, stretch the window. You can, you can be doing anything you want to, and everything keeps running. So, it never is unresponsive. But... You know, any Windows users have have run across the, the, this. You know, the the phenomenon of Windows itself putting up in the browser. Um, I mean, putting up in in the window title that that 
you know, this application is no longer responding, you know, you know, and yet the opportunity of, of closing it or waiting some more. So, so I guess the question like, really is why the Zynga is hanging. If it's hanging because the Zynga database server is unresponsive, then Flash could say, well, I'm waiting for the database server and Firefox wouldn't give up. So, it, But if it's Flash that's hanging, of course, Firefox is, there's no way Flash could say, I'm waiting for something. It's just hanging up. Well, and I'm not a Flash developer, so yeah. I don't know if well, they have the notion of threads and, you know, like a... a I bet you separate. Flash is a single thread. I would be surprised if it's more than one thread. It could be, and that and that could explain it. If it's waiting for the server, or it, it was related to slower machines. So it might just be doing a whole bunch of crunching to decide, you know, if it's time to plant more daisies or whatever it is you do on the farm. So. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you hit it. You hit the nail on the head. You plant daisies. <laughs> <laughs> push up daisies <laughs> and in other firefox related news i thought it was just interesting to note and you probably saw this leo that ibm has formally switched to firefox really yes from the entire corporation internet explorer uh they uh, i ibm has said we're 100 percent moving wow. to firefox well welcome to 2008 ibm yeah. you're gonna love it it was a great year <laughs> yep uh, there was a little blurb about YouTube having some problems with cross-site scripting. Um, but I think I saw you talking about it on one of the other um, podcasts. Uh, yeah, the, XSS, we were, yeah. In my yeah, I, very ham-handed way, I wish you'd been there. Well, we, we've, we've covered it in detail in one of our prior podcasts. The problem is it is extremely difficult to allow the world to post its own right. text onto your web page. It's hard to sanitize. Yes. A cross-site scripting flaw is one where, essentially, for example, in any kind of a blog where you accept comments, where users are able to submit text, which the web server then posts onto the web page. What happens, of course, is that everybody who views that page is looking at the text that's been submitted. The problem is that hackers are never ending in their creativity, figuring out ways to obscure the, the look, the actual content of what they're posting so in, in a way that, you know, I mean, whether it's scripting or, or using, you know, Unicode to, to, that expands to other characters. It's just amazing how, how sophisticated they've become in figuring out ways to, to post something which is ends up being malicious or mischievous. In this case, it was people getting a whole ton of uh, YouTube viewers getting a bunch of pop-ups and in some redirections to adult websites. Yeah. So in this case, not anything really nefarious, but um, well, and you know, they fixed it. Google fixed it. Yes. Yes. Uh, they they immediately took the comments down and then at, you know looked at what looked at how it was being done added some filters for it, and then put them back up, which is really all you can do. I went to a great presentation by Dan Kaminsky, and by the way, I said hi, and we love you, and thank you for finding that DNS flaw, uh, on exactly this, on what the best ways are to sanitize inputs. You are, because this is really one of the biggest uh, security vulnerabilities, is, you know, sanitizing user entered data whether it's a url in, in, or comments in web in web 2.0 that's it's the problem it, it's the it's the problem and he came up with a very interesting solution that i didn't fully understand but it was a great uh, session um he based 64s everything and um i you know i'll see if i could find it uh, he'll probably be giving it at black hat or somewhere and I'm, i'll see if i can find it but it was a very intriguing solution and he gave a lot of different scenarios and so forth um and it but the point not being let me suggest a solution because I don't understand it well enough to actually suggest it. But the point being that even the top security people, this is what they're working on right now, is how do we have a, you know, let's create a library that we can safely sanitize user input. This is a big issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a little blurb from India. The Indian government uh, stating their need to monitor for terrorism has demanded from Skype and RIM, the, the people who do BlackBerry, and Google the ability to read, the, essentially the ability to decrypt their content. To, to, so so the, in, the, the India government says, 
in order as an anti-terrorism measure um all the text in skype and blackberry and gmail need to be decryptable by the government now um this actually came up in 2008 with with rim and the blackberry and it was interesting because i learned something i didn't know before and that was that rim's architecture specifically prevents this only the end users have the keys necessary for communicating so you know it was designed in a in a my favorite acronym tno trust no one mode so that so that they said look we you know we're not sure we'd want to comply but we can't our system is so secure that you know we don't have the keys to decrypt our customers communication it's you know the architecture doesn't allow it and the issue just sort of in, in 2008 when this was brought up between India and RIM, it just sort of died off and no one's really sure what happened. But RIM's architecture, as far as we know, hasn't changed and it's still super secure. So um, this just sort of represents, you know, a, a, a worrisome blip on the radar that, I mean, it's you can understand governments feeling the way they do, but... People also want to have the right to, to communicate privately. So um, Google is expanding its suspicious logon location technology. We talked about that many months ago um, where Google will notice if the location you log on from appears to be geographically very different in a very short period of time. So, for example, you, you log in in the USA and then, you know, a short time later, like, you know, half an hour later, you log in in the UK and they say, uh, wait a minute, how did he get to the UK that quickly? I've had know. that happen and it's, it's a little disconcerting, but I'm glad they do it. Yes, um, it can misfire because geolocation by IP is not a perfect science. Um, and, you know, they don't do anything except notify you. That is, they're not locking you out or, or causing a big problem. They had only been doing it for Gmail. And the cool thing is they're now ex expanding that, sort of using Gmail as an initial test bed uh, and deciding that this ended up being a good thing. They're now expanding it to work across all of their um, web-based services. So that's very cool. Uh, I, I think they get deserve huge applause for what they've done with Gmail. And I hope that they extend this to web services. Maybe this is what you're talking about. But if you go to the bottom of Gmail, you can see all the IP addresses that have recently been used to access your account. Yes, and that is now going to be universal oh, across all Google that's services. That's such a great idea because if you have any suspicion, and I have from time to time, that somebody has got my password or whatever, you can immediately verify that. I just wish they went back farther in time. It only goes, I think, 24 or 48 hours. It, it is so incredibly useful to see that and know exactly who's been accessing your account. Yeah, it, it totally makes sense. Yeah. Now, there was, uh, in the news in the last couple of days, some uh, stories that were a little overheated saying that Skype's encryption had been cracked. Uh, people worrying about that. There was uh, essentially some, some very good reverse engineering done. And I wanted to put everyone's mind at, at rest that uh, Skype's encryption has not been cracked. Um, so... A guy who people believe is using a pseudonym of Sean O'Neill um, uh, essentially posted um, that that they had reverse engineered Skype's encryption. Now, Skype's overall cryptography architecture is really good. I've looked at it in the past just because I was curious, and I've got it on my own notes here to do a whole episode on the 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 security architecture of skype much as we're going to talk about the security architecture of LastPass in this episode um we we have developed over the last five years for four weeks short of five years all of the all of the bits and pieces we need to where where there we're talking about specific technologies Fitting these together into systems is 
is one of the things I want to spend some time on moving forward and looking at how Skype works in terms of, you know, how do they use these things in order to, to, to create an architecture is, is something I want to do. Well, what this Sean O'Neill, whatever his real name is, going by the name Sean O'Neill, what, what he or they have done is essentially they reverse engineered some pieces of what Skype has done, which Skype has kept proprietary. Now, essentially, um, you know, we've talked about security by obscurity. That's a, you know, a, a, a favorite term people like to use sort of in an absolute sense of, well, you know, you know you, if you rely on security by obscurity, then you have no security. Eh, um, it's certainly the case that if you depend upon obscurity, you can't ever count on it enduring. Well, Skype is not depending upon obscurity except to prevent competitive creation of clients that is skype compatible clients mm. so what so w back in the early days of this podcast we talked about the rc4 cipher rc4 is the cipher which skype uses because it is extremely lightweight extremely efficient and if you use it right extremely secure RC4, of course, popped up onto the world's radar because that was the that that was the stream cipher chosen for all of those reasons by WEP, W-E-P, the insecure Wi-Fi encryption, which was originally developed. The problem was not that it was using RC4, but it was misusing RC4. It was not using it in a secure fashion. And it was exactly that that caused a lot of the Achilles, he Achilles heels of, of the, the implementation of early crypto on Wi-Fi. Well, the Skype guys know their crypto and they're using RC4 the way it should be used, but they haven't published the details of the keys and the initialization vectors, which are part of what you have to have in order to create a Skype client. They've not wanted people creating knockoff Skype clients. If, a, if someone did, then that, that, that clone of the Skype client would still have to obey all of the security architecture, which would mean it would have to be as secure as Skype's own client. But it was the fact that there was a lot of this that was unknown, like the real deep inner inner plumbing. The Skype folks had never published, and they probably they they they'd apparently wanted to keep it to themselves so that people could not create Skype client Skype clones. Well, now this is out. These guys reverse engineered it, and one of the other major principles of this podcast that we've talked about from time to time is, of course. It can be reverse engineered. Anything can be. It's why it took no time at all for, you know, Blu-ray DVD and HD DVD, you know, those ultra state-of-the-art cryptography technologies to get reverse engineered because they were going to be, if it's going to live in someone's living room and the device that's there can decrypt it and it has to in order to put it up on the screen, then engineers are going to figure out how it's working. Similarly, Nothing that the Skype folks can do, by definition, can prevent someone from reverse engineering the guts of that client. We've, you know, you and I are using Skype right now. Our clients at each end are encrypting and decrypting our conversation on the fly. So the fact that I've got something running in a computer right here next to me, which is doing that, means someone can look inside while it's doing it and figure out how. There just isn't any way to prevent that. So this is news from the standpoint of, well, yes, some, something that the Skype folks had so far managed to keep to themselves, to keep proprietary, but which their security architecture does not depend upon at all, 
that's now been figured out. It's been reverse engineered. So, okay, that doesn't in any way weaken Skype security. It means that you could, if someone wanted to, create, you know, Maybe. knock off Skype clients. It's easy know? enough for them to change their secret sauce with, uh, you know, and make right. it secret again. Right. Oh, that's a very good point. They, yeah. they will, well, yeah. They yeah, control the client point. and they, I mean, there's, you know, they, just yep. update it. Yep, they, they, they could add some ciphers, and if it's supported at each end, then the new cipher would take hold, and over time, Skype would get updated, and they would all support the new one, and then it'd be back to reverse engineering. So I am still, as good as Skype is, remember you had a great project that you, you kind of thought about uh, for a kind of better way to do it for podcasters only, with a ring buffer, and I'm going to find an open source programmer who knows telephony to write something that's just for the kind of stuff we do. There's a lot of features in Skype we don't need. And there's features you know, that we need that Skype doesn't do. Yeah. Um, uh. <laughs> I don't want to sign this to you. I know you got other things to do. In fact, CryptoLink is so much more important. I wouldn't even dream of saying anything. In fact, forget I mentioned this. Well, yeah, the, the idea, just for, in case our listeners are curious, was that there's no reason that you couldn't have absolutely perfect communication by having another channel running in the background which makes up for lost packets. Right. Is, we need real-time signaling as a, for a conversational reasons. Yes. But we would like... <laughs> a perfect recording. A perfect recording. Result. So yes. if any packets are paused or, or delayed we would like to preserve them and use them either you record it locally actually ideally you record a copy locally we get a second channel with a perfect copy and then we have the channel that's on the live stream that we use for our conversation that's real time yeah but and but imperfect yep. i think i'm gonna we're gonna this would be a great project for twit to fund i would make it open source because i think other podcasts could really use this skype has been great but skype is is designed for something completely different. We're really not using the tool for the, the purpose we need. And I can think of a few other things like multi multi channel audio that would really be nice. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's a crazy idea, but I, I, well, I'm going to talk to some people. Complex though. Would you add video? I you know, I know. If it were, the video well, is a problem, isn't it? If it were audio only, it's like ah, it's not a hard problem. I mean, yeah. I I could give somebody all the work I did because I did you know develop that codec that that you listened to up in up in Toronto once. You right. Know, that was. You know, actually doing it, and in fact, I, I I used it to to remember exactly how to do that Star Trek phrase backwards. I uh, the way I wrote it, you could reverse <laughs> you could reverse the buffer, and it would say whatever you said backwards. So that was fun. It's fun being a programmer. I, to to follow up on the uh, on the the dog killer, portable dog killer. I know we were talking about physicality and, and it's fun to build things. We're going to go to Maker Fair at the end of the month and, and see people who are doing amazing things with their hands. But I think programming is also an incredibly satisfying hobby. And, and when you are little things like this, to be able to write your own software is so great and so satisfying. Uh, I th and, and you know what? In this world, potentially very lucrative. If you're, a, if you're a young person thinking about a career, learn to program. If you've got an aptitude for it, the world needs you. I need you. Well, and I don't know what's going on, but there seems to be some sort of acquisition fever happening lately. I mean, everybody's buying everybody. Yeah. And what and one of the things that I'm seeing is that you know if you develop something which is good, big companies will come along and just buy it because it's easier for them to do that than to develop it themselves. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned it was on. That's oh, it. I think it was one of you. I think it was on the tech guy last weekend. In the context of of Starbucks Wi-Fi now going completely free, I meant to have you on, and we got to still do this on the radio show. Get you call in. How do you secure yourself now that millions of people are going to be using Starbucks free Wi-Fi? It's funny too because I noted that when I went back for my refill yesterday, there was clearly more. I mean, I'm very much in tune to the pulse of my local Starbucks. There was clearly more businessmen executive sort of looking dudes yeah. with their laptops can you than, imagine than we normally see what a fertile ground for a hacker well it is and i thought you did a really good job actually by following the, i think it was life hacker had a a a nice story about the things you needed to do yes i used their the, outline yeah the one thing that i have said before that 
occurred to me as I was listening to that list that was sort of missed is that um, one of the things that Windows has done that I think is very nice and, and clever, uh, not original with them, but still a good idea, was the Windows firewall, it, it allows local file sharing on the LAN that is, it looks to see whether the source and destination of the, of file sharing traffic is in the local subnet or whether it's an IP bound for outside the local subnet, which it blocks, which is re really a nice solution because it automatically means that your own, you know, residential or small office file sharing, which is so convenient, you know, to map map drives and just or map folders and just drop files on them and they, they shoot across the LAN and, and they pop up on the other machine. That's really handy. And then you're automatically protected from that not going global because it looks to see if it's on the LAN. Well, the one big problem with that is that when you're on a Wi-Fi network, that network is your LAN, which means that, you know, you're in, you know, suddenly you go to Starbucks and, you know, you're taking a machine, a laptop, where you, in your home network, you've got things, you know, files and, and drives, file shared, made available. Well, when you go and go, go, go to Starbucks, what the what the firewall now sees is all the people at Starbucks, whether they're good people or not, are on the same LAN. So that technique, which is very useful when when your LAN is friendly, works against you or certainly not for you when your LAN is unfriendly. And open Wi-Fi is by definition an unfriendly LAN because you're not encrypting your traffic and suddenly, I mean, without intending to, you're sharing any of those resources on your LAN, which is now the Wi-Fi network. And that's something I've never heard anyone mention before. So I just wanted to, I, I have said it on this podcast before in, in that context also, because it's, I always, I always remember it's like, Ooh, you know, Whoa, be careful about that. Good that's point. Potentially a biggie. You sh but you should absolutely turn on the windows firewall. Oh yeah, it ought to be on all the time. All the time. It's, it's yeah. not in your way normally. So, exactly. exactly. So that's a yeah. good thing. But and, it's just not enough. <laughs> right. Uh, and I've got a great little spin right story to relate. Um, and then we'll get into our content. Good. Uh, this is from Paul Bye, B Y E. Um, and he emailed it to our tech support address. So I don't know where. Oh, there's uh, Rochester, Minneapolis. Um, he said, Dear Steve and GRC staff, I'm sure you get so many of these you can't keep up. Well, but we love trying to keep up. Uh, <laughs> But I wanted to add my praise and thanks to you for Spinrite. I've been a faithful listener to the Security Now podcast and was just itching for a reason to buy Spinrite. I finally had the chance when my mom's hard drive crashed last year. When did he send this to us? Because uh, uh, 2nd of February, I'm, I'm digging down a little bit. Um, uh, when, it cr when it crashed last year, the power in her house has always been suspect, and it finally did her hard drive in. While the drive was really beyond repair for future use, I was able to run Spinrite and recover all her data, including her precious pictures of her granddaughters. She's now set up and knows how to run regular backups. The other day, one of my heavily modified dual drive TiVo systems started making funny noises. I immediately unplugged the machine knowing all I needed to do was run Spinrite, and it would probably be okay. While not containing any crucial data, I had many hours of recordings and many, many hours of modifications I had made. That sounds like my TiVos, too. I had made and really would not have wanted to lose them. Amen. Three hours later, 1.5 hours per drive, it was up and running, no funny noises, in fact, quieter than it had been before, and maybe even a bit faster. 
Besides not having to redo all the work I did on it, the savings of buying a new drive alone paid for Spinrite. As a programmer, I certainly appreciate how few pieces of software there are that live up to their billing. Spinrite is definitely one that does. I love the podcast. I think it's the best on the internet. And I thank you for all the work you do and share with listeners. Thanks. Sincerely, Paul By, Rochester, Minneapolis. And thank you, Paul. Thank you. We love people who buy Spinrite. GRC.com. Let's get to the meat. I'm very excited about LastPass. I uh, really want to hear about how it works and whether I've been foolish trusting all my data to it. But before we do that, I'd like to point you towards my friends at Citrix who do so many great products that the kings of remote access on Windows. Of course, the Citrix Enterprise solution is, uh, is the solution. Go to my PC, go to meeting used widely everywhere. Maybe the support people don't know it, but there's a great Citrix product for you, too. If you're in software support, uh, if you are an IT person, even if you're just like the support person for your family and friends, you might want to look at GoToAssist Express. G-O-T-O, assist.com, slash security. That's the place to go. You can try it free for 30 days. That means as many sessions as you want. Go to Assist has some very handy, easy-to-use features designed specifically for support. First of all, your clients don't have to have it installed. That's huge. You get it installed now. Go to assist.com slash security. And then when you want to start a support session, you can either send your client a link. I've done it in chat with my mom. I've been chatting with my mom. And uh, she's, or actually, I think I was Skyping with her. And she said, oh, this wasn't working. I pasted a, a link into the Skype chat. She clicked it. And, and within a minute, I'm in and fixing her computer. Uh, you can also send them to the GoToAssist site with a, with a ticket number, and they can do it there as well. But once you're in the system, and I, by the way, Mac or PC, so you don't even have to think about what operating system they're using. It just works. You can copy uh, fixes or patches uh, from your system to theirs just by dragging and dropping them across. You could start a session on one computer, then move to another session, another session, another session, up to eight sessions simultaneously. These can be unattended if your clients approve it, which is great. You don't have to wait till they're there. If their computer's on, you just get in there and fix it. Um, they'll give you an assay of what operating system's running, what security software, everything that's going on in the system right now, so you don't, you're not in a mystery state about it. I can go on and on. I just want you to try it free. 30 days. You could see and solve problems without being there in person and make that makes you a support hero. Go to assist.com slash security. Go to assist.com slash security. 128-bit SSL encryption end-to-end. -end. So even if they're at a Starbucks, no problem. There's no, there's no risk. <laughs> free customer service 24-7. I could go on, but why? Just try it free. Go to assist.com slash security. We thank them so much for their support. They're very friendly, genial support of the Twit Network, generally and specifically security now. They really are the greatest. Now, last pass. I, uh, I think I found out about last pass from this show. I think somebody wrote a note. I've used RoboForm, which was Windows only. I think they're doing a Mac client. And I've also on the Mac used 1Password, which was Windows, uh, rather Mac only. But then when I found LastPass, first of all, it's very affordable. It's there's a good free version and a buck a month you get some ad additional features. A buck a month, and it works on everything that I use, including all of my portable devices: the iPad, the iPhone, the Android systems, Blackberries. So I, you know, I fell in love with this. But I'm not you, Steve, and I just trust it. I had to say, well, I trust that they're doing it right. It looks like they're doing it right, but I'm very glad that we're going to get this. We're going to find out. The Steve Gibson checkout. Okay. So one thing I want to do in this podcast is I'm, I'm going to go against something that we've done in the past, which is to rely heavily upon previous podcasts. Okay. Uh, for, for, the, for explaining the crypto stuff, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to assume any prior knowledge. We're not going to go into the depth that we have before. So people who want to follow up, who will like say, well, I want to actually understand how some of these things that Steve talked about actually work. We've covered all of this in the past. So, so that's all there. Um, but I don't want to assume that someone listening to this remembers all of that. So on the crypto stuff, uh, th there'll be a little bit of redundancy that way, but not a painful amount of it. Um, because, and the reason I say this is understanding the architecture 
uh, that these guys developed is the key to understanding why it's safe to trust them, why I trust them, and why I've completely switched my entire solution for managing passwords after spending days researching it and testing it and playing with it over to LastPass, which I have. So let's step back a little bit and look at and, and understand what the problem is we're trying to solve. Um, the very early episodes of this podcast, nearly five years ago, we spent several episodes talking about passwords, personal password policies and you know, the, the whole issue. And, you know, the password is the sort of the original security technology. I mean, backdating from the early days of Unix machines, which were the first machines on networks, it became important, became crucial, necessary to, to identify users. And so the idea was you'd have a username and you'd have a password. The idea being that the username was something everyone knew. It was public, but the password was something only you knew. And, you know, we've talked about what it takes, you know, the whole problem of managing passwords. The problem is that all other things being secure, that is assuming that a system of some sort, whatever it is, doesn't have any other security problems. If it's password based, then the one vulnerability is guessing the password. That is, if you know someone's username, you can think, okay, I mean, you know, and we've seen this in movies and things. It's like, okay, let's see, what might their password be? Well, I know the name of their kids. Let's try that. I know mm. the name of the dog and their parents and the, <laughs> the dog is they, what they, happened uh, to Paris Hilton. Everybody yes. knew her dog's name. Right. Yes. Not a good password no. to use for that reason. So, <laughs> so the problem is that the vulnerability is guessing the password. In fact, remember that just last week we talked about the FBI and the Brazilian government both failing after years of trying to crack the TrueCrypt encryption of someone whose drives they had acquired, who was a suspected money launderer. They spent years using a dictionary attack where they had a dictionary of words that they just kept trying. Well, that was brute force password guessing that the this person whose drives these were was smart enough to use a password not in the dictionary. Had it been a simple dictionary based word, he, his security would have been cracked that way. So, so the idea is you want a password that that isn't going to be guessable, that isn't in the dictionary. Well, the other thing you need is something, if it's so, so we'll, we'll call it gibberish. You know, it's 32X5707 or something, just gibberish. Now the problem is it needs to be long because the next attack on a gibberish password is to try every possible combination of gibberish. You know, you start with A, then you do, don't use A. That's a bad password, by the way. That's what, that's the <laughs> Which, first one you. That's the that's the other first or, one you or try. Or Z, because sometimes they try the backwards one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and even if you even if you did Z, but they started at A, that's only going to take them twenty six tries. That's a good point. Yeah. So, a, so anything A through Z, bad. Bad. <laughs> yeah. And then you go A A A B A C A D and so on. And so now, if, you, if it's a two-character password, and if, assuming it was all, for example, lowercase, well, then it's going to be 26 squared, and we can still try that many in a short time. So the point is that it is possible in many scenarios to try every possible password. Now, every possible password gets to be many pretty quickly. But what that means is, the longer your password is, the stronger it is because every character you add, say that we have the characters lowercase a through z, that gives us 26 possible characters in the so-called alphabet. Um, then if, say we had then uppercase a through z, 
and that it, these, these passwords are case sensitive, meaning that it matters whether it's an uppercase A or lowercase A. So now, so before we had 26, lowercase. Now we add 26, uppercase. So we're to 52. Now if we add the digits, 0 through 9, we're at 62. And say that we just add two more special characters, plus and minus. That is, we, we allow a plus symbol or a minus symbol. Well, that gets it to 64. Well, 64 is a special number because that's 2 to the power of 6 which is to say it's the same as six bits of password strength. So using just the alphabet and the digits, plus a couple more characters, we get six bits of strength per character, which is to say 64 possible combinations for a single character. For two characters, that's 64 times 64, because we have all of the possible characters with 64, and then, then 64 of those first characters for all the, the second characters. And if we add three characters, it's 64 times more, and the fourth character, 64 times more. Well, if you start multiplying 64s, this gets to be a very big number very quickly. So the point is that computers are fast, and... Who knows whether the FBI actually started trying gibberish? Maybe they did. But if it was sufficiently long gibberish, it's, you just can't try them all. Well, how many years did they try it? Well, they tried for many years. I think so it was two years. Two years, tried. if they have fast systems, is a billions and billions of attempts. Attempts, yes. Although um, systems are also, and I think TrueCrypt being a well-designed system, the other thing that that systems will do. And I know, for example, that WPA, the good encryption for Wi-Fi does this, is that the actual, the actual algorithm for turning a password into a key is itself complicated. So I, I don't remember, I think it's 4,096 iterations of some cryptographic functions that WPA goes through. So a single attempt d takes a while, but not long. It's short enough that we don't notice it. But it, it, what it means is that, that many, 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 many attempts is scaled up by a deliberate increase in the complexity of the algorithm that gets the key from the password. And, and I would be surprised if TrueCrypt hadn't done the same thing. So that meant it was infeasible. That is to say, yes, you can try lots of passwords, but each one is expensive in it's computational. Take you a while. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. in computational time. And that's a deliberate overhead added in, you know, by good security people who want to prevent this kind of brute force, just try every possible combination of gibberish. So... So what we've done is, in, in here in the last 10 minutes, we've walked through the problem. The problem is we, we want a really long gibberish password if we don't want, in order for it to be secure. Now, the next problem is, you know, you, you could imagine, okay, I'm going to come up with a really long gibberish password. That's going to be my password. But... You don't want to use the same one all the time because the other problem is that say you log on to your bank with your email address and this monster amazing password. It's like, great, that's safe. But if you also log on to, you know, uh, storiesmydogtoldme.com or something... <laughs> With that's your the email, problem. <laughs> with your your email address and the same and that right. same monster amazing password. Exactly. Now the problem is, it's yes, that's really strong. Except that we're not too sure about the security of the website storiesmydogtoldme.com, nor about the employees who work there. Because remember. They got your email address and this amazing monster incredible password of yours. So 
Um, and, and the same as the quick, it might be the case with malware in your computer. We know that people are getting themselves infected. If malware saw you log on to storiesmydogtoldme.com with your email address and this monster incredible password, there's nothing to prevent it from rummaging around in your computer and noticing that you're a B of A customer and thinking, hmm, I wonder if this person uses the same monster incredible password for all of the different sites they visit. And so, so you can imagine if you were someone who had an amazing password, but you only used one, right. then, then think of the liability. Everyone and all the sites you log into, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or, you know, tweet me or stories my dog told me and your banks and, and everything, they've got your email address and your password, which means it's really not yours anymore. No. I mean, everybody has it. And if there's ever a chance, I mean, they, they could just guess, you know, ah, I wonder if this person uses B of A. I wonder if they use Chase. I wonder if they use, you know, that they could just... Put in your email address and this password, and wow, it's going to work. If they guess even like where you might go, you know, like what, what, what groups you're members of. So it is not only do you need a really long, incredibly gibberishy password, but you need a bunch of them. So now we've got a big problem because how do you handle that? How do you manage that? How, how do you, you know... Now you literally somehow have to write them all down or record them all, and this is a big problem. If, if it was sufficient to have one really monster, incredible password, then it's like, okay, you could potentially memorize that. We've talked about fun ways to do that, like think of the lyrics of a favorite song and, and choose you know, the first character of each word in the lyrics in order to help you remember it, and, but then you know, maybe salt it with a few digits in between or if the lyrics have the word four use the number four and then you know that kind of stuff so so there there are fun ways to help you with that but the problem is that's not what you want to do because we already ex established that it's really not safe to use the same or even a small set of really good passwords among a huge number of sites because you could because of this problem of, of, of inter-site or cross-site usage. So the way to be secure is to have long gibberishy passwords and a separate one for every place you log in. That way, no one can ever try to log you in, some, to log in as you, to impersonate you for whatever nefarious purpose. If they know your password for this site doesn't help them at all on some other site which is really what you want. The problem is managing that, which is what, what various password management tools do. LastPass does that. The idea is that, it, uh, that LastPass has plugins for, that, that is, you know, uh, you know um, additional functionality that they add to all of the popular browsers. Um, they've got browser plugins from everything from IE version 6 on up, Firefox version 2 on all platforms that, it, that Firefox runs on, Google's Chrome from version 4 on on all platforms where Chrome runs, uh, Safari from version 3 on OS X and from version 5 on the PC, and even Opera, which is plug-in hostile. Opera doesn't have a plug-in architecture, so they use something called bookmarklets, which we'll talk about a little bit because that's one of the solutions, for example, over on a browser like the iPad, where it also doesn't allow plug-ins. They actually have a clever solution. They have their own tabbed browser, which is, I mean, LastPass has now an iPad tabbed browser, which includes the iPad, the last pass functionality as a way a way to get it because here's one of the thing one of the reasons I like LastPass so much is they've just completely covered the landscape um, for mobile devices they've got uh, iPhone iPod touch you know uh, uh, Apple's iOS 
they have the tab browser on for the iPad. They've got their plug-in for Android and for the RIM BlackBerry, for Windows Mobile, for Symbian, and for Palm's WebOS most recently. So it's everywhere. And that's really what you need because it, essentially what we're going to do, what, what the security conscious last past user will do is, is go through and probably improve your passwords. Probably there's been some laziness along the way. There's been the reuse of passwords that you like or that you've memorized just because, you know, some new site that you're visiting for the first time says, you know, what password do you want to use? And so you go, uh, I think I'm going to use the one that I like. Well, okay, that's a danger as we have established. So you really need to, to come up with and to even fix retroactively passwords which you're using which are not safe. The problem is, how do you remember them? And that's what LastPass solves. However, if it wasn't available on anything you might possibly want to log in on, now you've got another problem. Because, you, you know, you've got these long gibberishy passwords that you can't possibly memorize, which is part of why they're so good. But unless they're available on any platform you would, would, would be using, you've got a problem. So they've got the bases covered, I mean, absolutely and completely. Yeah, and I mean, fact, I use everything there could be used under the sun, and I haven't found anything that it doesn't work with. No, it's always there. Even and the fact, iPad. Yes, even the iPad. Um, what these what these bookmarklets are, a bookmarklet is a bit of JavaScript, which is like a URL that is, it, it sort of runs like script on a page. And that allows them to sort of shoehorn themselves in to literally any browser. So if you, if you didn't have any plugin, for, or for example, you were, you were using somebody else's browser that didn't have a plugin, you could still use these bookmarklets in order to, to get access to your own personal library of passwords. So, so that's what LastPass creates, is your own personal library of passwords. What LastPass users have or the, a, a, a level of reasonable discomfort with, and I did when I was, when I was first installing this and, and setting things up, LastPass you know, has also a form fill-in capability. And it was suggesting, why don't you give me your credit card numbers? It's like, uh, what? You know, um, or, and it even has a, a, a secure vault where you can put just your own notes, which you want to have available anywhere that is in, on any of these platforms, you know, containing anything whatsoever. The question is, how is this safe? How am I, how is it that I am not giving the last pass people who I want to trust, but do we trust everyone who works there? Do we trust everyone who's, who has ever worked there in the past, who will ever work there in the future? Um, do we trust, you know, that like that somebody won't break into their servers and, and in the middle of the night and, you know, have this huge, massive win of getting all of the username and passwords for everyone who is using LastPass. So the way this works is, and the, re the reason I'm using it is I now understand how it works and why it's absolutely trustable is that very much like Jungle Disk, which we've talked about in the past, all the encryption is done locally. That is, at no point does LastPass receive anything other than what looks like a block of pseudo-random noise. We've talked about how when you take so-called plain text, the normal readable, human readable, you know, your username as an email address and your actual password, and you encrypt it with a good cipher, it turns it into, under the influence of a key, which is the key to the whole process, under the influence of the key, it turns it into noise. Absolute pseudo-random bits that mean nothing. So, so that's what 
the last past system gets and saves. It is absolutely no use to anyone because they never get the key and they've gone to great lengths to arrange never to get the key. When, when you log into their system, you do so with your username, which is your email address and your password. That's, that's put together, con concatenated into one long string. They, they sanitize the username a little bit. They lowercase it and they remove the so-called white space, you know, spaces and things. That just makes it a little more robust. The password, they don't change at all. So that remains case sensitive and special, char special characters and things can be in there. They leave that alone. But for example, email addresses are not case sensitive. You can, you know, you can change the, the case in an email address. And so since they're using their email address, people's email addresses as their password, users might not be careful about the case in their email addresses. So they make that case insensitive. They always lowercase the, the email address ASCII characters, the alphabetic characters. So they, they put all this together into one blob. Then they do something called a hash. They use SHA-256, which is a, uh, SHA stands for Secure Hashing Algorithm. The listeners that have have been listening to the podcast for years know what that means. For people new to this, a hash is what's called a one-way function. You can take any amount of text or anything, binary data, anything, any amount of data and run it through this process called hashing, which always results in a fixed size thing, sort of a fixed size token. And what's unique about this is it's, it is computationally infeasible is the technical jargon that cryptographers use to go the other direction. That is, it's, it's, it's very easy to put stuff into this, think of it like sort of as a meat grinder, but it's impossible to ungrind the meat. It's, it's been ground up. It's been completely, it's been turned into this 256 bit result such that anything you change in the input changes everything about the bits in the output. Yet anybody, no matter how much they want to, no matter how much they, they look at it, they can't go the other direction. So the idea is that, that your, when you log in, when you give your system your last pass username and password, the first thing it does is it runs it through this SHA, it, it, it lowercases the, the, the email address, removes the white space, um, adds the password, and then it does this hash to it turning it into a 256-bit blob, which tells the blob holder nothing about your username and password. It's just been, it's like it's been digested into this thing. In fact, hashes are called digests also for that reason. What that is, is that is your cryptographic key. That's the key which your system will use both to encrypt your, your data which is being shared with LastPass corporate and also to decrypt it when LastPass corporate sends this back to you. They're holding the encrypted results of your own personal database just because that's what they do. That, that's the service they provide, essentially, that and creating all these amazing plugins for everything anyone's ever heard of. So, but, but what they're holding, they have no ability to decrypt. They never get the key. Um, that never leaves your system. Now, they do need to know that it's you. That is, you, they, they, need to, they need to know that it is you who are logging in so that they and so that there needs to be an authentication process so you identify yourself to them but we don't want them to get the key so what they do is they take 
that key, the cryptographic key, and they add your password to it. That is, they concatenate your password to your cryptographic key, and they hash that. So they do another one-way function on your crypto key with your password, which they don't know because they never get it, but they get another blob. So, so this second blob, the second output from the hash, that's your unique ID. That is, the only way to get that is if you take your username and password, hash it, then add the password to that and hash it again. So it absolutely depends upon both of those pieces of information. So then your username and that goes to LastPass to identify you. And because that contains your password twice hashed into it, nobody who doesn't have your password, even if they have your email address, is able to produce that blob. So you have to have your email address and your password run through this hash twice to get that blob. But notice that your cryptographic key, which is sort of the, the, the first byproduct of that, because that's the output from the first hash, that goes into the second hash but is lost in the hashing process. So thanks to it being mixed with your password. So the last pass people never get your crypto key. They get a different unique token that identifies you to them so that you're able to log on securely to their facility. And these guys are so paranoid that they don't even save that on their servers. <laughs> they don't even save that special logon blob, the output from that second um, hashing process. Instead, they, at the time you create your account, they come up with, they use a random number generator at their headquarters to create a unique 256-bit token, which they save with your account. And whenever you're logging in, they take this 256 blob you're sending them, that's the result of these two hashing processes, they add that to this unique 256K random number, and they hash that, and that's what they compare to what's stored with your account. So, which is to say, they never store that logon token. They store the result of hashing that logon token with a unique 256-bit value that they created for you so they dynamically see if it's the same, and they, but they never save your logon token. They just they don't want it. They don't need it. So they're, dynam they're able to perform a dynamic check whenever you need to authenticate, but they don't keep it statically. So, I mean, this thing is secure every way you can imagine, and it's simple. The reason it appeals to me is that there's no hocus pocus. There's no mumbo jumbo. There is, I mean, I can explain it to you and understand it, which means I believe it because there's no, you know, oh, then a miracle happens and just trust us. That's not necessary. The result of this 256-bit hash where they take your username and password and hash that to get the, the, the key for the encryption, that is used with the industrial strength, maximum strength, AES 256-bit cipher that we've talked about, which takes 128-bit blocks at a time and turns it into 128 bits of gibberish under the influence of the key. So the whole concept here is that, that we, we establish a database of domains that we're logging into, and username and passwords for those domains. And this is our personal database. And the beauty of this, and I've, I've been playing with this now for about a week, is that, for example, I did change a couple passwords because I've been a little lazy too. And I thought, okay, now's the time. So I changed those passwords here at home on my system 
in Firefox and, you know, change them in the website and LastPass watched me change them. I said, okay, remember this and LastPass remembered it. And then the next morning on my iPad, I wanted to log into the site. Well, I didn't write it down. I, I mean, you can't write these things down. Well, you could, but it would be a, a pain. Using my iPad, and I don't remember if I was using the bookmarklet for the iPad, which which is easy to create, and I have, or, or LastPass's own iPad tabbed browser, which they have available, but whichever, um, I opened the site, went to the logon page, LastPass saw Oh, it was the it was the tab browser because it was an automatic process. The bookmarklet, you you invoke it to fill in the form. It won't do it for you automatically. When you're using any of these plugins, which are so widely available on on virtually any browser that allows a plugin, they've 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 done that. And this is all cross-platform: Windows, Mac, and Linux. All of this stuff. So, um, it automatically saw that I was at the logon page populated the form and hit login button for me. So the whole process was automatic. I mean, I'm frankly, I've been spoiled now in the last week because this thing works so well. And my point was that, that because this exists in, in the so-called cloud, in the internet that we're all connected to, the change that I made in the logon credentials for that site, whatever it was, I don't remember now, it was stored by LastPass the plugin resynchronized itself with LastPass corporate, and they're on several continents and several different data centers. They back up themselves locally, and then they back up to using Amazon's S3 service nightly so that that's all being kept safe. And we'll talk about what happens if they go away in a second. Um, uh, and then the next morning on a, on a machine I had not used, on a platform I had not used, I was able to log in seamlessly using these new credentials because it was synchronized through the internet. I mean, it's, it's absolutely perfect. Now, now we've established this fantastic database, different passwords for everything, um, but we're dependent upon it. We, we can't function without it because we're no longer using, you know, something simple that we memorized or we're no, no, no longer using something complex you know, like the, our one master galactic password that we're using everywhere because we know that's not safe. But now we become utterly dependent upon LastPass. Uh, I mean, it, it it holds the login jewels to our entire online existence. So is that safe? I mean, is it, can we depend upon it? Well, we don't have to. They have covered that base too. They're, they have a standalone executable, a standalone gizmo. Um, trying to think of what it is they call it. Uh, not Sesame. That's their one-time login deal. Um, hmm. uh, I've got it written down here somewhere. Um, maybe. Oh, LastPass Pocket. Called right. LastPass yeah. Pocket. Available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. I've never used it, but it's uh, that's another feature I think is really important. And I have used it. Um, what this thing does is it is a standalone personal database decryptor. So you can, using their web interface or using any of these plugins, you can say, I want to dump my database. You can, you if you if you want to be risky, you can dump it using one of these plugins as a CSV, a comma separated value, plain text file, meaning that what you will see is all of this data, the, the domain, the username, and the password that, that they're holding for you in clear text, in plain ASCII. I say that it's dangerous because, you know, that would be like a feast for any malware that happened to be on your machine. I mean, you, you, I mean, that there in pure readable, simple text file is all the way to access all of the things you've ever, you know, you ever access. What's cooler is, I mean, but, but you can do it if you want to, and then, you know, copy it to a CD or do whatever you do with things that are really vulnerable. What's cooler is you can dump it in its, in its native form, 
in that encrypted blob that only you know how to decrypt. And you could do it anytime you want. So I would say for safety, every few days or well, actually anytime you like make major changes to this LastPass database, it's as simple as clicking on the little last LastPass button on your browser and say, you know, dump, uh, uh, export is the word they use. You export this entire blob to of, of, of encrypted data to your your drive. Now, what's cool about it is that the LastPass Pocket app, it doesn't install, no setup. It's just a, a simple, it just runs executable, which is, you know, the kind of exes I love or, or executables that I love. You are able to give it your username and your one LastPass, your, your, your LastPass password, which is the way this whole system functions. And then it's able to decrypt your backed up blob and allow you to view it, to, to see it, to, to, to browse it. So in addition to everything else, this is trivial for you to carry with you. You can stick it on a, on a thumb drive um, or on a, on a CD or, or you know, leave it lying around. It's just a blob of gibberish. It is, it is absolutely invulnerable to attack. It's the same content that they're storing for you. It's no longer synchronized in the cloud, of course, because it's now a standalone file. But what it does is it gives you this, the security of, of not needing to depend upon dynamic connectivity to the Internet. Now, the plugins do store a local copy of this so that... So that if you were offline, the, the plugins in browsers have their own most recent copy. So you're still able to, to access them locally and, and, and look at the data. Now, now, there, now, the next thing we need to look at is the, the vulnerability to somebody impersonating you logging into LastPass. Because notice what we've done now is we've, we have... We've created valuable content. It's now safe with the LastPass folks. It's now backupable. We're able to, to, to clone it, to, to create our own local copies. So, and we've got viewers that run on all platforms. So we know that we'll be able, if, if the worst happens, to manually look up, gee, what is my password for you know, Amazon.com? And I should mention also that there is a secure password generator as part of LastPass, as part of the plugins. Um, you can customize it a little bit. You can tell it how long you want your passwords to be. You can say, I want it to be, I want uppercase A through Z, lowercase A through Z, the digits. I want to allow or not allow special characters. I want to require a certain number of digits to be in every one of these, which gives you maybe a little more security. Um, and also, of course, you're able to specify the length anywhere from three to a hundred characters. Well, don't use a hundred characters. Um, first of all, many sites won't accept a hundred character password. I would say, and I thought about this for a while, 10. Yeah, I was going to ask you, this is a great question. Yeah, I would say 10, 10. 10 is enough. If, 10 is if enough. it's random, it's upper, lower punctuation and numbers. Yes, if you were to use, well, I even without special characters, the, I'm a little hesitant about special characters because some sites will like barf a little bit if you use, you know, funky random, you know, circumflexes and tildes right. and vertical bars and things. So, so, let, so let's return again to upper and lower case, which gives us 52, the, the digits, which gives us 62. Well, 62 is not quite 64. It's obviously too short of 64. Well, that happens to be, don't ask me why I know this, 5.94 binary bits of equivalent strength. Not quite six bits, <laughs> 5.94. one of those random things you just had yeah, in mind, Something that you cryptographers know. So if we take 5.94, and I got my calculator in front of me, we multiply that by 10. Well, that was easy. Why did I multiply? <laughs> Why did I get my calculator? That's 59.4. Oh, I know why I got it. It's for the next operation. 
bits, equivalent bits of binary strength. And so if we raise 2 to the power of 59.4, uh, I didn't do it. 2 to the power. Do you have a calculator in front of you? Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. It's my beloved HP. Oh, I hit, I hit, I meant the swap. Have you tried, For, completely off purpose, go ahead and keep typing. Have you tried any of the iPad calculators? There's, a, there's one called 42 that's really that's, got. That's the, one, that's the one I have. It's awesome. I love, I yeah. love 42. Yeah. Of course, we know why it's called 42. We do. Also. It's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Okay, so here we have uh, a 10-character password using only upper and lower case and the digits with 5.94 <laughs> binary bits of strength per character gives us 7.6 times 10 to the 17th <laughs> possibilities. That's a lot. <laughs> 7.6 times 10 to the 17th. I think that's the number of stars in the galaxy or something that like that. That's a large a, number. Yes. And this is they're, they're randomly chosen. They're gibberish. I would say no reason to go any stronger. You can if you want. But, but someday you might find yourself, for whatever reason, needing to type one of these in manually. For example... Um, the, oh, did I mention that all of this is free? Um, there is a paid version. I mentioned at the beginning, I pay a buck a month, but everything you've said so far, except for maybe the database dump. No, it's the, it's the, it's the mobile stuff. The mobile stuff's Their, not mo free. The mobile browser stuff is what they charge for. They have said that they're going to reserve the right to put ads somewhere um, like uh, some of their stuff is web-based where you, you, you end up using a, a secure web page, for example, to view your vault. You're able to view it locally also. You, uh, the, the, the browser plugins uh, open it up. In fact, on in Firefox, it's, it's Chrome colon slash slash and then the path to the file, wh 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 which they provide. So, By the way, 10 to the 17th, it's the number of meters in a, in a light year. No kidding. I'm just looking up orders of magnitude. Very cool. And it is roughly, it's a little less than the number of stars in the uh, galactic arm. Okay, that ought to do it. Yeah. <laughs> 7.6 times 10 to the 17th. Good luck guessing that, FBI. Anyway. Um, so, um, uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 uh, the, we were talking about no, the free so, stuff. What's free? What's paid? And the mobile yes, is the so, mobile. Yeah. So the stuff you pay for. So conceivably, they could put some ads somewhere. I haven't run across any yet. And they've said they will be tasteful, you know, little Google text style ads. I mean, these seem to be great people from, from everything I've seen. And I've, I've, I've got some of the questions that I had answered through some email exchange. And they've been also very responsive. Um, so it's the, the mobile stuff that you pay for. So the... The, the, the mobile versions of the applets. But all of the browser-based stuff, all of the re regular browser, I mean like, like phone mobile is, is, is what I meant, is free, as is the iPad touch, uh, the iPad tabbed uh, system is free. Um, uh, let's see, premium, oh, they, they do have, we, we'll, we'll be talking about... Uh, one-time passwords in a second. And YubiKey because, support and yes, all that stuff. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, but you know so, the real reason I pay them a buck a month? Because it's cheap and it supports the further development of the yes, program. These, these guys deserve it. I, I don't mean, pay them for the, for the additional features. I pay them because they deserve it. Yes, exactly. So my point was that I have the, I have the, Black, the last pass BlackBerry app on my BlackBerry. I, my BlackBerry now contains an encrypted copy of my master database. And if I ever need to log in somewhere where I have, where I have nothing with me but my phone, well, first of all, anything I'm logging into is a browser. So any browser that I encountered, I could use a bookmarklet in order to log in. That's how I do it on the iPad, by the way, that, yes. and the iPhone. That really works well. Yeah, and it just works perfectly. It yeah. fills in the form for you. It's like, oh, well, off you go. It's kind of neat. Uh, it's very cool. It's yeah. like magic. It's hard to believe. It's like, yeah. yeah, I'm so spoiled now. Don't so, tell Steve it's using JavaScript. Yeah, Shh. we'll be talking about that in a minute, Shh. actually. We're, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, so I would have my phone with me. So 
there I have the ability to authenticate to my phone locally. That is using the the my without any without any connection. I give my phone my LastPass username, which is my email address, and my my LastPass password. That unlocks for you know in there the the copy that my that the, my BlackBerry has. And I can look up my username and password for any of the sites in that database and unlock my own private note vault of stuff that, you know, that, that I want to like for, for copying, pasting or whatever, because they also support this idea of, of, of notes. And remember, they do form fill in. I have had it successfully now populate um, several different e-commerce uh, sites that I went to with my credit card information. I, I, I know LastPass only has an encrypted form, and this decryption happens on the fly in the browser using JavaScript or or with it where there's a plugin present. You you know in code in the plugin, so it's secure. So so because it's conceivable that I might need to manually type the password in ten characters, which we've seen is seven point six times ten to the seventeenth possible combinations. That's feasible for me to read off the screen of my iPhone or my, my BlackBerry and manually type in uppercase A, lowercase Z, zero, two, uppercase Q, lower, you know, and so forth, and be able to log in. So that's covered. However, we want to make sure that that we've so so what we've done is we've we've concentrated a huge amount of value into our LastPass authentication because authenticating with LastPass now literally unlocks the keys to our kingdom. So how is that made safe? Well, it's made safe through several techniques that we've talked about um, in the podcast um, in the past. Um, they support something very much like my own perfect paper passwords. They call it the grid and using they, when you log into LastPass and authenticate, you can have them generate a for you a random grid, which is A through Z and maybe it's zero through nine. I think that's all it is. It's and it's very much they they liken it to Battleship because so it comes up on the page on your browser. You print it, you snip it out, and you carry it in your wallet. When you activate the the grid, then any authentication is challenged by after you give them your username and password they challenge you by saying tell us the characters at b4 c9 um you know z7 and and q2 <laughs> and so you 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 got to get out your grid and like playing battleship you type in the character at each of those coordinates that's cool in order to say this is really me, because we, as we know, that's this is another factor of authentication. Now it's something I have in addition to something I know. I know my pat, my last ma my last pass password. Now uh, it's also something that I have. Is that kind in of how perfect perfect paste paper passwords is almost like? No. Well, perfect. The one it's not thing a matrix. That the one thing that perfect paper passwords does is it never reuses any of the strings it's the one time thing yeah yes it's one time now the grid could potentially i mean in in your farthest worry would be that something is watching you log on using the grid and is learning your grid so the only thing i would and i don't know i have meant to ask but i forgot to ask if they have any like you you need to update your grid they absolutely allow you to kill your grid and make a new one so, for example, if you left, if you lost it, or if you left it somewhere, you'd want to kill that one and make yourself a new one, which would be completely re-randomized and brand new, and the other one would die and no longer be useful. Um, oh, and that's true of bookmarklets, by the way, also. You're able to deliberately kill any bookmarklets that you might have left on a different browser somewhere, mm -hmm. or you might have temporarily installed somewhere. If you change your last pass password... That happens anyway, because I've done that. Yes. And none of my none of my bookmarklets work anymore. 
Yes, if you change your last pass password, then and you could tell Leo, I really learned this thing. I, <laughs> you, yeah, because I mean, I've been using this for a year, and you found stuff I hadn't even discovered yet. So yeah. So if you change your your last pass password, that obsoletes your bookmarks. But you can also explicitly do that just for security purposes. Although you will then have to recreate them manually, but that's easy because you're just able to drag and drop them from your from uh, from the page onto the you know the the um, the shortcuts bar. So you can. So I would say if you're a grid user and you're a heavy grid user, just obsolete the grid yourself. I don't know whether the, the, these guys do or not. Obsolete the grid yourself, you know, every few months. So that, I mean, it's very far-fetched that anything is memorizing your grid behind your back. But that's the only possible problem that I could see where perfect pay for passwords is a little bit better. <laughs> um, so the other thing they support is a very cool software one-time password generator oh and you can even you can even make one-time passwords that is using their web interface you're able to say generate for me some one-time passwords and you can click on it a few times I, I made up 10 and they're long mothers they're they're like whoa okay i'm gonna you know print this out or, or write this down very carefully and you can use those if you know in advance that you're going to be somewhere where you want to make sure no one can ever log in again and so so they they just like emit some you know every time you ask for one they'll generate another one and you could you could print them out and carry them with you and then they'll just like you know cross them off as you use them so and they're good until you kill them and you're able to kill them at any time or you use them exactly one time so they have a built-in one-time password generating facility there they also have sort of the equivalent of a software yubikey they do support our very favorite stina evansfard yubico's yubikey and so and and i i tried it out works great in fa you just go there um in in their uh configuration dialogue on their website they have got a tab, a YubiKey tab. You you go there. It's got room for I think maybe eight or maybe maybe ten different YubiKeys, so you're not just stuck with just one. Well, that's good because I worry about losing any kind of a dongle. Right, and so you're able. So so what I did was I just I plugged it in, set the cursor there, touched the YubiKey. It saw the, it's it got my YubiKey string, and that's all I had to give it because because remember the YubiKey has an ID as part of it and then the one-time password portion. And so you look up the YubiKey, they checked with Yubico Central and said, yep, we know about that YubiKey and, uh, and now we're ready to go. So you're able to have multiple YubiKeys and so what that would do is that's used anytime you need to authenticate with LastPass and you can choose the security level like in, in in with with multiple checkboxes of like I only want to I only I want to be able to generate passwords with LastPass that is have LastPass do all of its things and only authenticate once I want to require authentication every time I want to authenticate after so many minutes you know so there's various ways you 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 configure lockouts and the need to reauthenticate they do have one of their premium features, which is the $1 a month thing that Leo was talking about, they have something called Sesame, which, you know, as in open Sesame, is kind of cute. It's an app, again, cross-platform, Windows, Mac, and Linux, which is, it's just like a software one-time password. So it does the same thing that the cool little YubiKey oh, does. that's what I want. With, yes. Because then I can't lose it. Then exactly, yeah. you're, exactly. It, so, so you download it from them. You stick it on your, your the the USB any USB key, any USB as many as you want. I like you that. need to you need to authenticate to it. But when you do, it'll automatically log you in on your. It'll launch your browser, log you in, and authenticate you <laughs> all in one all in one process. Yeah, I'm, dead. I'm getting it right now. It is very cool. <laughs> Um, and they do have a, 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 um, a support for IE Anywhere, which is the sort of the, the, the mobile uh, uh, transportable version of IE. 
uh, which is useful because, of course, IE is pretty much everywhere. And the last thing is import. They do allow you to import from pretty much everything I've ever seen. And I'm going to run through it just once. So if you're currently somewhere else and I've sold you as I have sold myself on, on this thing being like the answer, you can import from Firefox's password manager. I had been using Firefox's password manager instantly last pass knew about everything that Firefox knew, which was extremely cool for me. Also from one password from Clippers, from something called Darn Passwords, from eWallet, from Fireform, from HP Password Safe, from KeyPass, obviously from LastPass. It's able to import its own file, by the way. From MSI Password Keeper, from My Password Safe, from PassPack, from Password Agent, Password Corral, Password Dragon, Password Keeper, Password Safe, Passwords Max, from Pins Password Manager, from RoboForm, from Splash ID, from Sticky Password, from Skip, from S X I P P E R, Zipper, I guess, from Turbo Passwords, and from a generic CSV file. So pretty much everybody there is, you can you can instantly suck your database in using their import feature of the plugin, and you're moved over to them. It's amazing. They just did it. Oh, and form filling is a very cool tool. You you can give it multiple credit I cards. I do that, yeah. You can tell I, it all I, about yourself. This, these are features that many browsers have, and the point is this is a more secure way to do that, and it turns off those browser features, by the way, if you ask it to. And cross-platform. I mean, right. it's, it's nice that a browser has it, but then, then you go to a browser you've never been to. I mean, even just... I, I, it happened to me in this last week. I set up a new system, and, and I said, oh, wait a minute. I I have LastPass, so I add, I added the plugin instantly. That new system knew everything about my world. You know what and you've done, you've done, Steve. Is I've been using LastPass in the in the kind of a fundamental, basic way all this time. Very happily, I've used the bookmarks, you know, and, and the various features. But now I'm going to go back and turn on some of these advanced features. I love this idea of being able to put a USB key with with this application on. I'm going to start doing that because I like multi-factor. You've taught me to love multi-factor authentication. I'm going to start turning that on. Well, That's a nice it, thing. It is the case that we are now storing all of our eggs in one basket. Yep. So you want it to be a safe basket. You want it to be a basket you can back up and a basket that nobody else can get your eggs out of. And... <laughs> They really, they really have nailed it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I don't see a single problem with this. The crypto is clear and simple, um, and uh, you know they've they've arranged so that they're never going to be in a in a position of anyone being able to like steal their stuff. Notice Cause they, also because they don't have it, right? Notice that no subpoena that they're served can force them to right. divulge your information. They don't have anything. They don't know. The they have only the result of the best encryption that that our, uh, that our world, the AES-256, the best, strongest encryption that we know how to produce, they only have the product of that. They yep. have the encrypted blob, and they have no key to it. They never get the key. It all That's stays very local. clever that they did it that way. I think that's incredibly clever. Yeah, it's well, it's correct. They did it right. One, I mean, from start to finish, and multi-platform, so they're not biased towards Windows and against Linux, folks. Windows, Mac, and Linux across the board for all of this. They, it, it's done. Steve, we uh, we have come to the end of this show, but uh, not to the end of your security now experience. Go to grc.com for transcripts. We are going to be late with those again because we, uh, because of my fault. Uh, some technical issues we had in the studio were a day late. Lane will get one. them done as soon as she can. But uh, they'll be there. grc.com slash security now. Also 16 kilobit versions. Show notes. Um, you can also subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash sn for the high quality audio and video. Uh, we also uh, encourage you to watch live when we do it normally Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv. GRC.com is also the place to go for spin right. Don't forget. <laughs> Steve, thanks so much for your patience. I'm glad we could do this on a Friday, and uh, we'll see you next Wednesday. On thanks Security for coming now. in for it, Leo, and we'll uh, talk to you next week. Take care.
security now.